too. Larissa Schuster was going through a bitter divorce from her husband, Timothy Schuster. She told friends that she wanted her soon-to-be ex-husband dead and that she could do it and get away with it. So when Timothy Schuster didn't show up to retrieve his son Tyler from Larissa per their custody agreement, alarm bells rang and Larissa quickly became the prime suspect in his disappearance. When the police learned the truth from Larissa's co-worker, they obtained search warrants. Following the execution of that search warrant, police found a 55-gallon barrel and the media would go on to call Larissa Schuster the acid lady. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 20 of the Students' Verdict podcast. What a satisfying way to end 2020 with episode 20. This was not planned, by the way. Thank you for joining me on another true crime adventure. To all of you new listeners, welcome, pull up a chair. My name is Emily and I'm your host. If you haven't already, please go and listen to some of our earlier episodes, including I Represented a Serial Killer and The Deadly Drug Trial. Please follow me on all the socials, Instagram at The Student Verdict Pod, Twitter at Student Verdict, and on Facebook, where I have a page and a group for us to chat and share. If you missed anything I just said, links are in the show notes. As always, if you enjoy the show, please consider leaving me a review. If you don't like me or the show, then please keep your opinions to yourself. As always, resources used in this episode will be linked in the show notes. In the show notes, you'll also find links to the Students' Verdict merchandise and my Patreon page. Any support you'd like to give is hugely appreciated. Now, with all of that said, let's jump into today's episode. Larissa Foreman was born in Clarence, Missouri on the 1st of January 1960 to parents Charles and Deanne Foreman. As a student, Larissa attended the University of Missouri, where she studied biochemistry. Whilst working at a nursing home, Larissa met Timothy Schuster, who was attending nursing school. Like Larissa, Timothy had also grown up on a farm in Golden, Illinois. The couple married in 1982 and went on to have two children. A daughter, Kristen, born in 1985, and a son, Tyler, born in 1990. Shortly before Tyler was born, the family moved to Fresno, California, where Larissa took a job at an agricultural research lab. She would later go on to open her own lab called Central California Research Labs, or CCRL, where she would specialise in biochemistry for the agricultural industry. Larissa was very successful in her field, and in 2000, the family was able to move to a large home in Clovis, California. And by 2001, records showed she was earning $160,000, double what her husband earned as an administrator at St. Agnes Medical Center. As Larissa worked long hours, getting her business up and running, neighbors reported that she routinely left the house at 6.30 a.m. and wouldn't return home until 7.30 p.m., leaving Tim to take on the mother and father role. By 2001, Larissa and Tim's marriage had started to deteriorate, and in February 2002, Larissa had filed for divorce. Larissa complained of Tim's supposed impotence and would later admit to having had an affair in 1993. Despite the divorce proceedings, neither spouse moved out at first, opting to sleep on two different floors of the home. Around the 4th of July 2002, while Larissa was away visiting relatives in Missouri, Tim packed up his things and left the family home. When Larissa came home and realised, she was furious. She then asked someone who came to her house to work on a barbecue if he would help her enter Timothy's residence and retrieve some of her property. On the 8th of August 2002, 
Larissa asked a chemist at CCRL, Leslie Fachera, to rent a storage unit at Security Public Storage, which was located a couple of miles from the lab. Larissa told Fachera she wanted to store some things she wished to keep hidden from Timothy. Fachera rented unit A182 in her own name and then turned the entry code and instructions over to Schuster. A couple of days later on the 10th, Timothy returned home from a trip to find his residence ransacked and items he had shared with Larissa were gone. Included in the missing items was the report Timothy had been using to document his involvement with Tyler for custody purposes. Larissa would later tell people she and James Fagon were responsible. She told her manicurist she had gone back a couple of times because it gave her a feeling better than sex to sit in a chair and look at what she had done. She admitted she keyed Timothy's pickup and that it was like a trophy which gave her a happy feeling every time she saw the key mark on the side of his truck. This behaviour caused the couple's relationship to deteriorate further. As a result of Larissa's actions, Timothy had an alarm system and motion sensors installed at his home, and he even obtained a handgun and a concealed weapon permit. Larissa asked Fichera if her boyfriend knew anyone who could rough somebody up. She also said that she prayed every night her ex-husband would die. She also told a fellow member of her church choir that she would do everything in her power to keep Timothy from getting her business. These are just a few of the odd things Larissa would say. She even asked the barbecue repairman if he would go to Timothy's house, stun him with a stun gun when he answered the door, whilst she would be waiting a couple of houses away. Funnily enough, it seems as though he wasn't up for the idea. On the 30th of April 2003, a blue 55-gallon barrel was purchased and sent to CCRL, although it was not the type of barrel normally used at the lab. Larissa supposedly told staff it was for yard clippings. At the lab, they had a number of different acids on site, including hydrochloric, sulfuric and acetic. However, very little of these acids was actually used. Fichera reported that in her experience, no more than a bottle of hydrochloric acid would be used in a single year. It was particularly strange then when Larissa placed an order between the 13th of June and the 2nd of July for three cases of hydrochloric acid and one case of sulfuric acid to be delivered to CCRL. Each of these cases contained six lots of two and a half litre bottles of acid. Before things start getting really interesting in this episode, I'm going to take a quick break here to share an awesome new podcast on the block with you called Pineapple Pizza Podcast. This podcast is destined for big things. Welcome to Pineapple Pizza Podcast, where we serve up delicious slices of mythology, cryptozoology, and urban legends. Ashley is the Mythbuster. Tiresias is finally just like, it was you, okay? <laughs> <laughs> waterboard him with this magical gem that is not a testicle (laughs) emily is a cryptid hunter and it's this guy that's bending over and farting into the face of this absolutely horrified (laughs) cap but the cap is like no (laughs) in some stories this long narrow sheet of cotton is also your roll of toilet paper but it's evil toilet paper And Lindsay is the storyteller. So put your trains in the upright position. We're flying back over to northern Italy for a fun little legend that will have you rethinking water sports. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Am I pretty? I think I'm a snack. <laughs> She'd be like, what's a snack? Do you have candy? Pineapple Pizza Podcast. Stop on by for a slice, a story, and a laugh. Coming January 2021. 
On the 9th of July, Timothy and his good friend Mary Solis sadly lost their jobs at St Agnes. On the evening of the 9th, Timothy had dinner with Mary and Bob Solis and Victor Uribe Jr. Timothy left the Solis's home at around 10pm, having arranged to meet them the next morning. It therefore struck the Solaces as really weird when Timothy failed to show up for their meeting and for his scheduled exit interview at the hospital. Victor Uribe stopped by Timothy's house and found his vehicle in the driveway, but when he knocked, no one answered the door. With growing concerns about Timothy's well-being, the police were called and, having completed a cursory search of the house, authorities didn't find anything overtly suspicious. There were no signs of forced entry or a struggle. With this, the Solaces were told that they had to wait 24 hours to file a missing persons report. On the 10th of July, when Larissa arrived at work, she was complaining about a pain in her shoulder. She told everyone that she had hurt it by working out earlier in the week. That evening, Timothy failed to show up for the scheduled exchange of custody of Tyler. Larissa told her manicurist she had a feeling that the divorce was finally going to go her way. On the 11th of July, having waited the required 24 hours, Robert Solis filed a missing persons report with the Clovis Police Department. Officer John Willow attended Timothy's address When searching the property, he found a number of important items. He found a gun under the cushion on a chair near the front door. He also found Timothy's mobile phone. He scrolled through the phone and called every number to see if anyone had had contact with Timothy. When he spoke to Larissa, she told him she hadn't heard from Timothy. However, when the authorities spoke to her manicurist, who informed them of the troubles relating to the couple's pending divorce, the police felt it required further investigation. When detectives Vincent Weibert and Larry Kirkhart searched Timothy's house later that afternoon, they found some damage to the pony wall behind the chair on which the gun was found, as if the chair had been forcibly pushed into the wall. Inside a briefcase in the same room, there was a microcassette recorder and tape. Police then turned their attention to the phone in the master bedroom. The caller ID record showed one call received at 2.02 a.m. This call was from Larissa Schuster's phone number. With this and the information regarding the couple's divorce, Detective Kirkhart arranged for Larissa to come to the police department to speak with detectives. During the interview, which was conducted by Detectives Kirkhart and Weibert, Schuster explained that she and Timothy were going through a divorce and that they had had problems communicating, meaning they would sometimes go for weeks without talking or even exchanging emails. Larissa told officers that the last time she heard from Timothy was on Tuesday the 8th. Timothy had told her he was planning to pick Tyler up on Thursday at 6pm. She had last seen Timothy in person on Saturday the 5th of July. She explained that when Timothy failed to show, Larissa and Tyler tried to contact him, but without success. Larissa told police that she had learned of Timothy losing his job on Thursday evening and, out of concern, had called him around 8.30pm. When he didn't answer, she left him a message asking him to call her back. She said the last time she called Timothy that night was around 10.30pm. She drove by his house and knocked on the door at 10.30 or 10.45pm, after which she didn't try to contact him any further. When asked about the day Timothy had last been seen, the Wednesday when he saw the solaces, Larissa recalled that she had worked all day. Her shoulder had been hurting, so she and Tyler watched a movie that evening, and she had fallen asleep on the couch. When she woke up, It looked like her mobile phone had been dialed. She thought she must have rolled over and hit a button or something. Officers asked her if she had Timothy's number on speed dial. Larissa said she thought she did. She denied talking to Timothy or calling him intentionally.
Detective Wybert told Larissa that the last incoming call to Timothy's phone was from her phone number. Larissa insisted she had no explanation for that and did not have a conversation with him. During the interview, Detective Kirkhart offered Larissa a ride home. She declined, saying that she had her own car. Detective Kirkhart then offered her water and left the room to go and get it. Detective Wybert followed. Detective Wybert went to speak with the friend who attended the police station with Larissa, but found no one. Wybert then went out into the police station car park. There was only one vehicle parked out front, and it was Larissa's Lexus. As Wybert looked through the car window, he saw Larissa's phone sitting on the centre console. When he called Larissa's number, the phone began to ring, confirming that it belonged to her. Detective Wybert passed on the information to Detective Kirkhart. Larissa accompanied detectives to her car and was allowed to retrieve the phone. As they walked back to the interview room, officers noticed she appeared more nervous as her hands shook. It also appeared to them like she was trying to manipulate the phone in her hands. Detective Wybert asked to see the phone and Larissa handed it over. Detective Wybert determined that none of the speed dial numbers belonged to Timothy. When Larissa asked for water, detectives left the room, but they continued to monitor her from outside the interview room. When Detective Wybert returned, Larissa claimed that she had found Timothy's number under Tyler's name, but had just accidentally deleted it. Later, she admitted that she had made the call to Timothy's house. The reason she called him, she explained, was because she wanted to make sure that there would be no trouble on Saturday because she was afraid Timothy would not return Tyler from visitation in time for their trip. Larissa said that Timothy was half asleep, and she estimated the call was less than 30 seconds long. Larissa apologised for having not told the detective sooner, but promised she wasn't being deceitful and did not know what had happened to Timothy. Detectives continued to question Larissa about the church she and Detective Wybert attended, how detectives could reach her while she was away, and arrangements were made for Schuster to bring Kirkhart a notebook she discovered that Timothy had been keeping about her. Then the interview ended. The next day, Tammy Belshay, who had accompanied Larissa to the police station, went to Larissa's house. Larissa was still upset about the police interview, how the police had caught her in a lie, and how they might tap her phones or put a tracking device in her car. She said if they did, that they would know that she had gone to the lab at around 2-3am. She told Tammy Belshay that this was because she had gone to put on a sample run for Fachera. Tammy told Larissa that police could get search warrants for the lab and her home, even though Larissa might be away on holiday. Larissa later left her home and headed to the Fagans' house. When she arrived, James Fagan's father, Anthony, approached her. Larissa explained that she had come to talk to Mrs. Fagan about some baskets she had ordered. Anthony Fagan told Larissa she was not home, and despite Larissa's insistence, she simply took the bike and left. When Larissa returned home, Tammy told her that the police could take her computers and could retrieve anything that had previously been deleted. Larissa again left her son in Tammy's care, saying that she needed to go to the lab to pay bills. What was really strange was that between noon and 2pm, James Fagan came to Larissa's house. He walked in without knocking or ringing the bell, went upstairs, came back down quickly and left. Tammy tried questioning him, but he didn't answer. She described him as looking pale and sick. After going to the lab, Larissa contacted Leslie Fichera and asked for help to find a truck with a lift gate. Larissa explained that she needed it to loan a rototiller, not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, to a friend. They went to the U-Haul location on Blackstone between Bullard and Sierra, and Fichera rented a truck in her own name. Larissa left the U-Haul location separately from Fichera, with Fichera driving the rental truck. Larissa later picked the rental truck up from Fachera and rushed off. 
Fifty minutes later, she called for Chera and asked her to meet her at the U-Haul place. For Chera noticed that Larissa had scrapes on her shins and had blood on her shoe, which Larissa told her was from a smashed toe incurred while loading the rototilla. Security public storage records would later show an entry into and exit from Unit A182 during the time Larissa had the rental truck. No other entries were made between the 9th and 14th of July. On Sunday the 13th of July, Larissa and her son Tyler left on their trip. The following day, Fachera found an envelope on her desk at the lab, on which Larissa had simply written, Thanks. Inside the envelope was a cheque to the value of just over $510, dated the 8th of July and signed by Larissa. The memo portion indicated it was reimbursement for travel and lodging, but the only money Larissa owed was $40 for the rental truck. That evening, Leslie Fichera and Tammy Belshay went to the police. Detective Kirkhart obtained search warrants for the storage unit, the lab and Larissa's house. Inside the storage unit, officers found a blue 55-gallon barrel that contained what looked like human remains. DNA tests would later confirm that the remains were in fact those of Timothy Schuster. Only the lower half of his body remained. It had been placed into the barrel head down and was floating in fluid that contained hydrochloric acid. Timothy's body was in a state of early decomposition, with the time of death possibly being between the 9th and 11th of July. Tissue samples tested positive for chloroform, which can cause rapid loss of consciousness and incapacitation. The cause of death was probably the combined effects of acute chloroform exposure and hydrochloric acid immersion. Perhaps the most horrible thing out of all of this is it couldn't be determined whether Timothy was alive or deceased when he was placed into that barrel. When searching the lab's premises, authorities found a locked enclosure where the bins were kept. At the bottom of a dumpster, they found a case of six empty bottles of hydrochloric acid. Forensic analysis of Larissa's work computer showed that on the 13th of June, she searched some rather incriminating terms on Google. These included acid digestion tissues, acid digestion animal tissues, and sulfuric acid. On the 16th of July, Larissa Schuster was arrested at St. Louis Airport. When she was searched, the police found two receipts in her possession from a store halfway between CCRL and the Security Public Storage Unit. Both showed she had made purchases on the 12th of July for a few items, including Lysol and air fresheners. Lysol had been found in a fridge at CCRL. This was particularly strange, as such a product could lead to contamination at the lab, so would not have been used. Also in her possession was a card with the storage facility entry instructions and a code number. During Larissa's trial, the defence's strategy was to point the finger at James Fagan. James Fagan, a 25-year-old former employee at CCRL, had been interviewed by police whilst Larissa and her son were away on holiday. During his interrogation, James told authorities that Larissa asked him to buy a stun gun and zip ties, but that he hadn't known exactly what she planned to do with them. He admitted he had helped Larissa burglarise Tim's condo in August 2002. Larissa allegedly told James there were other things that Tim had taken when he moved out that didn't belong to him. James would later say he thought that they were going to Tim's house to take back other items that rightfully belonged to Larissa. As they began to plan their second burglary, Larissa explained that she thought Tim might fight back, so James suggested that they use chloroform to knock Tim out. He'd seen it in a movie once. James told authorities that he truly thought that they were just going to rob him. James then revealed that he and Larissa were responsible for the disappearance and murder of Timothy Schuster. The night of Tim's death went something like this. 
During the evening of Thursday the 9th of July 2003, Larissa called James and told him to get the supplies ready, and they made their way to Tim's house in Clovis. Arriving outside at 2am, Larissa called Tim's cell phone. Fagan told authorities that he crept up to the house while Larissa told Tim that their son Tyler was sick and that she needed Tim to come to his front door immediately. When he did so, he was met by Larissa and James. James then jolted Tim with a stun gun, while Larissa covered his mouth with a rag doused in chloroform. They then zip-tied Tim, driving his body to Larissa's house. At Larissa's house, both James and Larissa stuffed Tim's body into the blue 55-gallon plastic drum and poured in jug after jug of hydrochloric acid. James told police that Tim might have still been alive at the time the acid was poured in. Either way, by the end of that awful night, Timothy Schuster was dead, and that blue plastic barrel would be his blue plastic coffin. James Fagan was charged with first-degree murder and kidnapping, and went to trial in November 2006. His defence was that Larissa orchestrated the murder and that he had only acted as an accessory to the murder under duress. James maintained that Larissa had threatened his life, which is why he acted as he did. Defence testimony to support this assertion came from James's friends, co-workers, and even Larissa's friend Terry Lopez, all of whom testified that Larissa was very controlling and forceful. Despite James's attempts to recant his confession, the jury was still shown the footage from his police interrogation, during which he said, quote, I held the barrel for her, put him in, poured all the solution, and she, like, couldn't stand it. So she said, put it on, the lid on. So I helped her put the lid on, and she put it in the shed. When the jury returned their verdict, James Fagan was acquitted of the charge of kidnapping, but was found guilty of first-degree murder and residential burglary. What was interesting, though, before his sentencing, the jury pleaded to the judge for leniency on James's behalf. But, despite their pleas, the judge sentenced James Fagan to life without the possibility of parole. So that brings us back to Larissa's trial. Larissa's trial began on the 22nd of October 2007, more than four years after she was charged. The trial had to be moved from Clovis, California to Los Angeles due to the amount of pre-trial publicity, which could unduly influence the jury pool. The media had dubbed Larissa Schuster the acid lady. Prosecutors had alleged to the jury that Larissa attempted to solicit Tim's murder before, believing that she could get away with it. They told the jury how Larissa had access to all the chemicals used in the murder, being that she was a biochemist in a research lab. The jurors heard graphic and berating phone messages that Larissa left on Tim's answering machine. The prosecution asserted that Tim's death would be more profitable to Larissa than their impending divorce settlement. Tim's life insurance was only $30,000, and half of their assets were to be put in a family trust to provide for the children. However, with Tim's death, it eliminated the divorce fight in which Larissa stood to lose half of the marital estate, including the lab business sold in 2013 for $225,000, and the home in Clovis sold in 2004 for $675,000. James Fagan didn't testify at Larissa's trial, but Larissa did testify in her own defence. Larissa was on the witness stand for approximately five days, during which she flatly denied killing her husband. She testified that she had no foreknowledge of the murder and that James was the killer. She stated that James told her, quote, I heard him say something like, there had been an accident and Tim was dead. I thought he was joking. 
she admitted that she helped Tim move Tim's body. When asked about the phone messages on Tim's answering machine, Larissa replied with, quote, It is something I'm really ashamed about. You have to realise that is something, a result of many accumulative things. Larissa explained that the reason for the large amount of chemicals at her lab were not to be used for the murder of Timothy, but for a wholesale cleaning of the items at the lab. During cross-examination, Larissa stuck to her contention that she never solicited James to kill her estranged husband. Regarding the $2,000 to James, she said that this had been for babysitting Tyler and house-sitting while she was away. She informed the court that the reason CCRL had ordered so much acid was that it was needed to clean a large order of lab glassware. Medical experts testified that Tim's body had been cut in half and only his lower half had been placed in the barrel. Defence attorney Roger Nuttall used this line of questioning to imply there was another crime scene the police had missed altogether and that such undiscovered clues pointed to James as Tim's actual killer. Nuttall called a string of witnesses and experts to try and deflect blame from his client. Several character witnesses portrayed Larissa as a good mother and a non-violent person, and other witnesses described James as something of a wild card who often joked about committing strange criminal activities. During the trial, Nuttall called a psychiatrist, Stephen Etzner, who explained to the jury that, in his opinion, Larissa suffered from battered spouse syndrome caused by Tim's passive-aggressive behaviour and by a previous abusive relationship. Etzner recalled in his jailhouse interviews with Larissa how she spoke incessantly about how Tim had done her wrong. She expressed unhappiness about their relationship as if he was still alive. To Etzner, this indicated lingering signs of battered spouse syndrome. Etzner told the jury that Larissa's mental health had worsened in the later years of their marriage and she had been prescribed antidepressants. He explained that Tim and Larissa's personalities were diametrically opposite, which caused a strain in their relationship. Quote, My impression was that Mrs. Schuster was a very direct and assertive person, and Mr. Schuster was a more passive and nurturing personality. And I think they started butting heads over that. No prizes for guessing what the verdict was. On the 12th of December 2007, the jury found Larissa Schuster guilty of first-degree murder with the special circumstance of financial gain after just two and a half days of deliberation. Larissa expressed very little emotion at the verdict, but behind her, Timothy Schuster's mother smiled and her own mother sobbed. On the 16th of May 2008, Due to the special circumstance finding, Larissa was mandatorily sentenced to life without parole. At her mother's sentencing, Larissa and Timothy's daughter Kristen gave a victim impact statement, saying, quote, You've given up all rights as a mother, wife, daughter, friend and woman. You're a disgrace to this family, a pitiful excuse for a human. I pray you're continually haunted at night by the sight and sound of my father fighting for his last breathing moments on this earth. I hope you toss and turn and have horrible nightmares visualising the horrific act of violence you have committed. She ended her statement by saying, quote, Maybe later in life I can learn to forgive you, but I doubt it. This is goodbye. Not just for now, but forever. This is goodbye as your daughter. Tim's mother, Shirley Schuster, said, quote, I can't even imagine his last hours and the pain he must have gone through. How I wish I could have been there to help him with his pain. As she stared down the barrel of a life sentence, Larissa Schuster tried to appeal her conviction because of seven errors of omission or commission by the trial court. Firstly, she unsuccessfully sought to suppress statements she made to police in her interview from the 11th-12th of July 
arguing that the interview was conducted in violation of her Miranda rights. She argued that the interview became custodial when detectives discovered her phone in her car. Hence, she should have been advised of her Miranda rights. By failing to do so, Larissa argued that the evidence subsequently obtained should have been suppressed. The trial court found that Larissa's encounter with police was consensual. A reasonable person in the same situation would have understood that they were free to go, and therefore Larissa understood she was free to go at any time during the interview. Because there was no custodial interrogation, no Miranda warnings were required. The trial court therefore ruled that the statements were admissible in the prosecution's case-in-chief. The appeal court concluded that, although the officers never expressly stated Schuster was free to go, quote, after independently considering the totality of the circumstances, that a reasonable person in Schuster's position would have felt free to terminate the interview and leave at all times during questioning. This, therefore, wouldn't amount to a ground of appeal. Larissa also contended that the trial court committed reversible error and violated her federal constitutional rights when it discharged juror number 001 near the end of the trial. The jury was sworn in on the 18th of October 2007, and from this date, juror number 001 caused problems. She was consistently late, she would wear sunglasses in the courtroom for absolutely no reason, and her general behaviour would distract the other jurors. There was also the suggestion that juror number 001 was using her phone when she shouldn't. The appeal court concluded that the trial court did not abuse its discretion by discharging juror number 001 or denying Larissa's motion for a new trial. Since legal grounds to discharge the juror existed, it follows that the discharge of the juror did not deny Larissa her federal constitutional rights. Larissa argued that the trial court erred by refusing to give a requested pinpoint instruction defining the uncharged crime of accessory. Larissa's proposed instruction went something like this, quote, Larissa Schuster has admitted to being an accessory after the fact. She was not charged with being an accessory after the fact. To prove that the defendant was guilty of this crime, the people would have to prove that, one, another person committed a felony, two, the defendant knew the perpetrator had committed a felony, three, after the felony had been committed, the defendant either harboured, concealed, or aided the perpetrator. 4. When the defendant acted, she intended that the perpetrator avoid or escape arrest, trial, conviction, or punishment. She continued, quote, If the defendant formed an intent to aid after the crime was completed, then he or she may be liable as an accessory after the fact. Factors relevant to determining whether a person is an aider and a better include presence at the scene of the crime, companionship and conduct before or after the offence. End quote. The trial court denied Larissa's request for a pinpoint instruction, finding accessory after the fact is not a lesser included offence of the crime charged, and that courts are no longer required or allowed to instruct on lesser related offences. The appeal court summarised all of this as follows, quote, It has never been the law, that an accused is entitled to instructions on offences for which she is not charged, in order to urge the jury that she could not have been convicted of something other than what is alleged. Another proposed appeal ground, Larissa argued, was that her trial attorney provided, quote, constitutionally deficient representation when he presented evidence that Larissa suffered from battered spouse syndrome, but then failed to request an instruction telling jurors how they could use that evidence to find Larissa acted under provocation if they found her responsible for killing Timothy. During the trial, the psychiatrist, Etzner, found that Larissa's statements that she wished her estranged husband were dead as a type of passive homicidality, suggesting there was no indication of an intent to kill the other person. The psychiatrist explained that Larissa's passive wishes for Timothy to die were a way of escaping a very bad relationship and so were consistent with the application of emotional BSS to Larissa's case. It should be noted that the burden of proving ineffective assistance of counsel 
is on the defendant. With regards to the BSS, the appeal court didn't find any authority allowing evidence of battered spouse syndrome to be admitted on the issue of provocation. The court found that the jury was given a comprehensive instruction on provocation and heat of passion, and nothing in that instruction precluded consideration of battered spouse syndrome. It was held that the giving of a pinpoint instruction relating to BSS and provocation wouldn't have made any difference to the verdict. The court therefore concluded that Larissa failed to establish that her defence counsel lacked a reasonable, tactical purpose for the omission or that Larissa was prejudiced. I promise we are almost through the appeal grounds. Have you noticed when we talk about the appeal grounds in cases like this, there are always so many grounds. The worst, I think, was the episode when I covered the toolbox killers. If you've listened, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, just make sure that you're comfy when you start listening. That's all I'm going to say. Anyway, Larissa raised two claims in connection with the instructions on the financial gain special circumstance. Firstly, she argued that the trial court made an error in answering a question from the deliberating jury about the definition of that circumstance. And secondly, she argued that the trial court violated her federal constitutional rights by refusing her requested unanimity instruction. Larissa stated that the emphasised language directing jurors to compare and consider the evidence undermined the presumption of innocence and lightened the prosecution's burden of proof by suggesting that Larissa was required to produce evidence to be compared. So, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I'm sure you already know this because you listen to true crime podcasts all day, every day like me, but in a criminal trial, the burden of proof is on the prosecution, meaning it is not for the, for the defendant to prove his innocence, but for the prosecution to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The instruction given to the jury during Larissa's trial was taken from something called, and remember this case is in America, so this is not something that I personally am familiar with, but it's called CALCRIM, C-A-L-C-R-I-M, number 220, which states that the fact a criminal charge has been filed against the defendant is not evidence that its charge is true. You must not be biased against the defendant just because she's been arrested or charged with a crime or brought to trial. When considering whether the prosecution proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt, the jury therefore has to impartially compare and consider all the evidence that was received through the entire trial. Unless the evidence proves the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, the jury must acquit and find her not guilty. Quite simply, the Court of Appeal rejected the argument that Calcrim No. 220 suggests that the defendant is required to produce evidence and so rejected this proposed ground of appeal. Finally, Larissa contended the cumulative effect of errors committed at her trial rendered the proceedings fundamentally unfair, thereby violating her right to due process. Again, very simply, the Court of Appeal stated the following, quote, Since we conclude there were no errors, it follows that there was no cumulative prejudice. Larissa received a fair trial. I feel like they just got to a point where they were bored. They were bored of hearing her grounds. They had no merit. So they just said, it's all good. We, we're not going to say any more than that. Um, so with all of that, after his mother's prison sentence was upheld by the Court of Appeal, Tyler went to live with his maternal grandparents. This is Deanne and Charles Foreman, who are obviously Larissa's mum and dad. Kristen the daughter, the Schuster's daughter, alleges that the communication she has with her brother is limited and she worries that he won't know the full story from his grandparents. Kristen now has a young son who she says she plans to talk to about his grandfather who is in heaven. So that's where our story ends today with Larissa Schuster and James Fagan still behind bars. Thank you so much for joining me today. The Student's Verdict is a bi-weekly podcast, so please follow us on social media to hear about our next episode. The Student's Verdict can be found anywhere you listen to podcasts, including Spreaker, 
YouTube and iHeartRadio. See you on the next one. And remember to keep living the dream. Thank you.